Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to lesson number five in the series on Genesis. It's titled All Nations and Babel, and it's ready for teaching on April 30, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 23. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you listening to this reading of your word and the Sabbath school lesson from many different places on earth. And we speak different languages in different parts of the world. And this week we're looking at All Nations and Babel as our title for the lesson. And Genesis 11.9 tells us that therefore its name is called Babel because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. But we know that you have not just a language of love, but a language of salvation for every one of us. Whether we come from Barbados or St. Kitts and Nevis in the Caribbean or Zamboanga in the Philippines or Buenos Aires in Argentina or Pretoria in South Africa, or Geraldton in Western Australia, or Istanbul in Turkey, or Seoul in Korea, or Oklahoma City in Oklahoma. Lord, we just want to thank you that you are the God who loves everyone on earth. And as we read your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will show us that your face is open to each of us, and that your word shows us not only that you love us and care for us, but that you have a plan for us. And we give ourselves to you today as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 11 and verse 9. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Let's read that again. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 9. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. After the flood, the biblical account shifts from a focus on the single individual, Noah, to his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The particular attention on Ham, the father of Canaan, in Genesis 10 verse 6 and verse 15, introduces the idea of Canaan, the promised land, in Genesis 12 verse 5, an anticipation of Abraham, whose blessing will go to all nations, as we'll eventually read in Genesis 12 verse 3. Let's read Genesis 10 verse 6. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizram, Put, and Canaan. And verse 15, Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. And Genesis 12, verse 5, Then Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. And Genesis 12, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. However, the line is broken by the Tower of Babel that we read about in Genesis 11, verses 1 to 9. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. 
Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Once again, God's plans for humankind are disrupted. What was supposed to be a blessing, the birth of all nations, becomes another occasion for another curse. The nations unite in order to try to take God's place. God responds in judgment on them, and through the resulting confusion, the people get scattered throughout the whole world, as verse 8 said. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city, thus fulfilling God's original plan to fill the earth, as Genesis 9 verse 1 had previously said. In the end, in spite of human wickedness, God turns evil into good. He has, as always, the last word. The curse of Ham in his father's tent, in Genesis 9, 21 and 22, then he drank of the wine and was drunk and become uncovered in his tent, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside, and the curse of the confused nations at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, verse 9. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This will eventually be turned into a blessing for the nations. Sunday, April 24, The Curse of Ham Read Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 to 27. What is the message of this strange story? Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk, and become uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So... Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Noah's act in his vineyard echoes Adam's in the Garden of Eden. The two stories contain common motifs, eating of the fruit resulting in nakedness, then a covering, a curse, and a blessing. Noah reconnects with his Adamic roots and, unfortunately, continues that failed history. The fermentation of fruit was not a part of God's original creation. Noah indulged, then lost self-control and uncovered himself. The fact that Ham saw his nakedness hints at Eve, who also saw the forbidden tree in Genesis 3 verse 6. This parallel suggests that Ham did not just see furtively by accident his father's nakedness. He went around and talked about it without even trying to take care of his father's problem. In contrast, his brother's immediate reaction to cover their father, while Ham left him naked, implicitly denounced Ham's actions. The issue at stake here is more about the respect of one's parents. Failure to honour your parents, who represent your past, will affect your future, as we read in Exodus 20 verse 12. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And we'll compare that with Ephesians 6 verse 2. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. 
hence the curse, which will influence Ham's future and that of his son Canaan. Of course, it is a gross theological mistake and an ethical crime to use this text to justify racist theories against anyone. The prophecy is restricted to Canaan, Ham's son. The biblical author has in mind some of the corrupt practices of the Canaanites, as recorded in Genesis 19, verses 5 to 7. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. And Genesis 19 verses 31 to 35. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old and there is no man on the earth to come in to us as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down and when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. In addition, the curse contains a promise of blessing, playing on the name Canaan, which is derived from the verb Cana, K-A-N-A, meaning subdue. It is through the subduing of Canaan that God's people, the descendants of Shem, will enter the promised land and prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, who will enlarge Japheth in the tents of Shem, as it says in Genesis 9.27. This is a prophetic allusion to the expansion of God's covenant to all nations, which will embrace Israel's message of salvation to the world, as we read in the following texts. Daniel 9, 27, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and suffering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And Isaiah 66, verses 18 to 20, For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall be that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come to see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and those among them who escape I will send to the nations, to Tarshish and Pul and Lud, who draw the bow, and Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands afar off, who have not heard my fame, nor seen my glory." and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Then they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all nations, on horses and in chariots and in litters, on mules and on camels, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord, and Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The curse of Ham will, in fact, be a blessing for all nations, including whichever descendants of Ham and Canaan accept the salvation offered them by the Lord. And so to finish today, Noah, the hero of the flood, drunk. What should this tell us about how flawed we all are and why we need God's grace every moment of our lives? Monday, April 25, The Genesis Genealogy The chronological information about Noah's age makes us realise that Noah serves as a link 
between the pre-flood and the post-flood civilizations. The last two verses of the preceding story, Genesis 9, 28 and 29, take us back to the last link of the genealogy of Adam in Genesis 5, 32. Let's read Genesis 9, 28 and 29. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. And Genesis 5.32, And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Because Adam died when Lamech, Noah's father, was 56 years old, Noah must surely have heard stories about Adam, which he could have transmitted to his descendants before and after the flood. Read Genesis chapter 10. What is the purpose of this genealogy in the Bible? Also look at Luke chapter 3, verses 23 to 38. Genesis chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togomah. The sons of Javan were Elishan, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, every one according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havila, Sabta, Rama, Sabteca, and the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalneh, in the land of Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rebaboth, Ir, Kela, and Resen, between Nineveh and Kela, that is, the principal city. Mizraim begot Lodom, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtuim, Pathrusim, and Cashulim, from whom came the Philistines and Kaphtorim. Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the Gergesites, and Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and Arvadite, the Remedite, and Hamathite, and afterwards the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. And the order of the Canaanites was from Sidon as you go toward Gera, as far as Gaza. Then as you go toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasher. These were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. And children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder. The sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arpaxad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arpaxad begat Salah, and Salah begat Eber. To Eber were born two sons, and the name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan begat Almadad, Shelef, Hazamavath, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, Dekla, Obel, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling place was from Mesha, as you go towards Sephir, the mountain of the east. These were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations. And from these the nations were divided on the earth after the flood.
and Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse 23. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janna, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathiah, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Eslai, the son of Nagai, the son of Marth, the son of Mattathiah, the son of Semai, the son of Joseph, the son of Judah, the son of Joannes, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, and the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosan, the son of Elmodam, the son of Ur, the son of Jose, the son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonan, the son of Elikam, the son of Malia, the son of Minan, the son of Mattathah, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arpaxad, the son of Shem, the the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. The biblical genealogy has three functions. First, it emphasizes the historical nature of the biblical events, which are related to real people who lived and died and whose days are precisely numbered. Second, it demonstrates the continuity from antiquity to the contemporary time of the writer, establishing a clear link from the past to the present. Third, it reminds us of human fragility and of the tragic effects of sin's curse and its deadly results on all the generations that have followed. Note that the classification of Hamite, Semite and Japhethite does not follow clear criteria. The seventy nations foreshadow the seventy members of the family of Jacob in Genesis 46 verse 27 and the seventy elders of Israel in the wilderness as read in Exodus 24 verse 9. So first of all, Genesis 46 and verse 27. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were seventy. And Exodus chapter 24 and verse 9. Then Moses went up also Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. The idea of correspondence between the seventy nations and the seventy elders suggests the mission of Israel toward the nations. As you read in Deuteronomy 32 verse 8, when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. Along the same line, Jesus sends 70 disciples to evangelize, as you read in Luke 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. What this information shows us is the direct link between Adam and the patriarchs. They all are historical figures, real people from Adam onward. This also helps us understand that the patriarchs had direct access to witnesses who had personal memories of these ancient events. And so to finish today, read Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. What does this teach us about how historical all these people were? Why is knowing and believing that they were real people important for our faith? Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, 
and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa. And Asa begot Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Isaiah, and Isaiah begot Jotham, and Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, and Manasseh begot Amon, and Amon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after I brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begot Abiod, and Abiod begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliod. Eliod begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Mathen, and Mathen begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So, All the generations from Abraham to David are fourteen generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are fourteen generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are fourteen generations. Tuesday, April 26, One Language. Read Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. Why were the people of the whole earth so keen to achieve unity? Genesis 11, beginning at verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The phrase, the whole earth, refers to a small number of people, those alive after the flood. The reason for this gathering is clearly indicated. They wanted to build a tower to reach the heavens, we just read about in verse 4. In fact, their real intention is to take the place of God himself, the Creator. Significantly, the description of the people's intentions and actions echo God's intentions and actions in the creation account. They said... Genesis 11, verses 3 and 4, we read, and we'll compare that with Genesis 1 and verse 6. Here it is here. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And, verse 9, Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And verse 14, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, etc. Let us make, they said in Genesis 11, 3 and 4, and we compare that with Genesis 1, 29, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Their intention is explicitly stated. Let us make a name for ourselves, in verse 4 of Genesis chapter 11, an expression that is exclusively used by God in Isaiah 63, verse 12, 
Who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them, to make for himself an everlasting name? And verse 14, As a beast goes down into the valley, and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. In short, the builders of Babel entertained the misplaced ambition to replace God the Creator. We know who inspired that, don't we? Isaiah 14, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. The memory of the flood surely must have played a role in their project. They built a high tower in order to survive another flood, were another to come, despite God's promise. The memory of the flood has been preserved in Babylonian tradition, albeit distorted, in connection with the construction of the city of Babel or Babylon. This upward effort to reach heaven and usurp God will indeed characterise the spirit of Babylon. This is why the story of the Tower of Babel is such an important motif in the book of Daniel as well. The reference to Shinar, which introduces the story of the Tower of Babel in verse 2 of chapter 11 in Genesis, reappears at the beginning of the book of Daniel in order to designate the place where Nebuchadnezzar has brought the articles of the Temple of Jerusalem. We read in Daniel chapter 1 verse 2, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Among many other passages of the book, the episode of Nebuchadnezzar's erecting the golden statue, probably on the same place, in the same plane, is the most illustrative of this frame of mind. In his visions of the end, Daniel sees the same scenario of the nations of the earth gathering together to achieve unity against God, as you read in Daniel 2 and verse 43, as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And Daniel eleven forty three to 45 He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. And we'll compare that with Revelation chapter 16, verses 14 to 16. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together in the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Though this concept fails here as it did at Babel as well. And so to finish today, a famous secular French writer in the past century said the great purpose of humanity was to try to be God. What is it about us, starting with Eve in Eden in Genesis 3 verse 5, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil, that gets drawn into this dangerous lie. Wednesday, April 27, let us go down. Read Genesis chapter 11, verses 5 to 7, and Psalm 139, 7 to 12. Why did God come down to the earth here? What was the event that motivated this divine reaction? Genesis 11, 
beginning at verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And Psalm 139, beginning at verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Ironically, although the men were going up, God had to come down to them. The descent of God is an affirmation of his supremacy. God will always be beyond our human reach. Any human effort to rise up to him and to meet him in heaven is useless and ridiculous. No question. That's why, in order to save us, Jesus came down to us. There was indeed no other way for him to save us. A great irony in the Tower of Babel account is seen in God's statement to see the city and the tower, as we read in Genesis 11 verse 5. God did not have to come down to see... We read that in Psalm 139, 7 to 12, and in Psalm 2, verse 4, it reads, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. But he did so anyway. The concept emphasizes God's involvement with humanity. Read Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 23. What does this teach us about God's coming down? to us. Luke 1, beginning at verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled as his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end." The descent of God reminds us also of the principle of righteousness by faith and the process of God's grace. Whatever work we may perform for God, he will still have to come down to meet us. It is not what we do for God that will bring us to him and to redemption. Instead, it is God's move toward us that will save us. In fact, the text in Genesis talks twice about God going down, which seems to imply how much he cared about what was happening there. According to the text, the Lord wanted to put an end to the people's deep-seated unity, which, given their fallen state, could lead only to more and more evil. That's why he chose to confuse their languages, which would bring an end to their united schemes. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 123, The schemes of the Babel builders ended in shame and defeat. The monument to their pride became the memorial of their folly. Yet men are continually pursuing the same course, depending upon self and rejecting God's law. It is the principle that Satan tried to carry out in heaven, the same that governed Cain in presenting his offering. End of quote. And so to finish today, 
How do we see in the Tower of Babel account another example of human hubris and how, ultimately, it will fail? What personal lessons can we take from this story? Thursday, April 28, The Redemption of the Exile Read Genesis chapter 11, verses 8 and 9, and Genesis 9, verse 1. Compare these with Genesis 1, 28. Why is God's dispersion redemptive? Genesis 11, beginning at verse 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And Genesis 9 verse 1, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And Genesis 1 28, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God's design and blessing for humans was that they would multiply and fill the earth, as we've just read in Genesis 9.1 and Genesis 1.28. Against God's plan, the builders of Babel preferred to stick together as the same people. One reason they said they wanted to build a city was so that they would not be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth, as we read in Genesis chapter 11 verse 4 yesterday. They refused to move elsewhere, perhaps thinking that together they would be more powerful than they would be separated and scattered. And, in one sense, they were right. Unfortunately, they sought to use their united power for evil, not good. They wanted to make a name for ourselves. A powerful reflection of their own arrogance and pride. Indeed, whenever humans, in open defiance of God, want to make a name for themselves, we can be sure it won't turn out well. It never has. Hence, in a judgment against their outright defiance, God scattered them across the face of all the earth, as we read in Genesis 11 verse 9, exactly what they didn't want to happen. Interestingly enough, the name Babel, which means door of God, is related to the verb balal, B-A-L-A-L, which means confuse, And we read that too in Genesis 11 verse 9. It is because they wanted to reach the door of God, because they thought of themselves as God that they ended up confused and much less powerful than before. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 123, The men of Babel had determined to establish a government that should be independent of God. There were some among them, however, who feared the Lord, but who had been deceived by the pretensions of the ungodly and drawn into their schemes. For the sake of these faithful ones, the Lord delayed his judgments and gave the people time to reveal their true character. As this was developed, the sons of God laboured to turn them from their purpose, but the people were fully united in their heaven-daring undertaking. Had they gone on unchecked, they would have demoralised the world in its infancy. Their confederacy was founded in rebellion, a kingdom established for self-exaltation, but in which God was to have no rule or honour. End of quote. And so to finish the day, why must we be very careful about seeking to make a name for ourselves? Friday, April 29. They decided to build a city, 
and in it a tower of such stupendous height. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 118 to 119. We continue. These enterprises were designed to prevent the people from scattering abroad in colonies. God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth, to replenish and subdue it. But these Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Thus, their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. The magnificent tower, reaching to the heavens, was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetuating their fame to the latest generations. The dwellers on the plain of Shinar disbelieved God's covenant that he would not again bring a flood upon the earth. Many of them denied the existence of God and attributed the flood to the operation of natural causes. Others believed in a supreme being and that it was he who had destroyed the antediluvian world and their hearts, like that of Cain, rose up in rebellion against him. One object before them in the erection of the tower was to secure their own safety in case of another deluge. By carrying the structure to such a greater height than was reached by the waters of the flood, they thought to place themselves beyond all possibility of danger and, as they would be able to ascend to the region of the clouds, they hoped to ascertain the cause of the flood. The whole undertaking was designed to exalt still further the pride of its projectors and to turn the minds of future generations away from God and lead them into idolatry. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, what example do we have from history, or even the present, of the trouble that can come from those who seek to make a name for themselves? Two, how can we as a church avoid the danger of seeking to build our own Tower of Babel? What are ways we might actually be seeking to do this, even subconsciously? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Miracle in UAE and it's by Guerino Lacuaro. Pradeep Leonaj hadn't really thought about Jesus until his son joined a Pathfinder club in the United Arab Emirates. The 13 year old boy came home filled with joy about the Bible stories that he heard in the club. As Prandeep and his wife saw the boy's enthusiasm and listened to the stories, a desire grew in them to know more, and they started to study the Bible with Muyi Oyinloi, pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Sharjah. The day came when Pradeep's wife and son gave their hearts to Jesus and were baptised. Pradeep also wanted to join the Adventist Church, but he had a sinful habit that he seemed powerless to break tobacco. Around the time of the baptisms, a new health ministries director was settling into her job at the headquarters of the Gulf Field of the Middle East and North African Union Mission. As Kathy Coleman examined her new office, she realised that she was lacking the health ministry's official stamp, which was vital for documents. A call to the former health ministry's director yielded both the stamp and several boxes of materials that she had known nothing about. The boxes contained various Adventist health programs, including Breathe Free, a smoking cessation program. While sorting out the materials, Kathy received a call from Pastor Moyi. Could you arrange the stop smoking program for Pradeep? he asked. Kathy realised that God had provided everything that she needed to help the man. God had put all the pieces together just in time for the pastor's phone call. Kathy got in touch with Pradeep and helped him through the nine-week program. He stopped smoking and, two months after completing the program, remained smoke-free and without cravings. 
With joy, he was baptised on Sabbath, March 13, 2021. The Lord has been blessing me both physically and spiritually in my life, he said. He has improved my health, my family is happier, and even at work I'm performing better. Now the 47-year-old man is telling everyone about Jesus and inviting them to experience his joy. Through his testimony about how he quit smoking, three new families have sent their children to the Pathfinder Club. Jesus is inviting every one of his followers to shine brightly for him, said Mark Coleman, president of the Gulf Field. The Lord is calling all of us to live a transformed life that will let others know of the love of Jesus in us, he said. This mission story illustrates mission objective number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach across the 1040 window. Read more at IWillGo2020.org. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.